That choir sound pretty this morning. I'll tell you what. That's a beautiful song. That, that's the one that I sing all day. B. That one, that is uh, kind of my, my brain worm there. Well, tonight we're going to go back just a little bit. Last week we were looking at the New Age Movement, which of course the uh, New Age Movement is probably quite excited about tonight since there's the wolf blood moon, what the full moon thing. So uh, they're probably pretty excited about stuff like that. Yes, there are actually people who do celebrate the moon. And um, not quite to the, you know, I say, wow, what a pretty moon. But uh, they, uh, they start banging drums, all kinds of things to the moon. Tonight I want to talk to you about actually not a world religion because when we come back together next week, we'll, uh, Pastor Kevin and I will be away at Pastor's Conference in Jacksonville. So I didn't want to start into probably one of the most... Uh, asked about religions of modern day, and that is Islam. So I did not want to start that tonight and then have a gap and then try to pick it all back up so that we can cover that all in one slice. So tonight I'm actually, we're going to go back to uh, a cult that is there that as we were talking about the New Age movement, I thought, you know, this might be one of those to kind of look back at and see how does the New Age, how do forms of, and this is not necessarily New Age movement, but you're going to kind of see some of the parallels there. Uh, how you know, are there actual religions or denominations, if we are, or churches, if you will, that really follow much of the structure and mandate that we find within the New Age movement? And yes, there is. And it is called the Unitarian Universal Association of Churches. How many have ever heard of the Universal Church? All right, the Universal, uh, universe, the Unitarian Universalist Association of Churches. Um, by definition, and you're going to see as we're going through this, that they are a cult. Uh, it is a cult, a cult that continues to grow in America. Um, as a matter of fact, members of this particular church are kind of in a loose confederation with a lot of self-described heretics. Um, they're very liberal. Uh, it's a very uh, liberal religion that champions the cause of extreme religious Tolerance. In other words, if you kind of want a religion that is the uh, whatever suits you is just fine, that's this religion right here. Uh, they're so liberal that only 9.5% of them actually identify themselves as Christians. Now, they're a uh, cult, but they're, they're viewed, if you look at uh, Christian cults and sects, you will see them in the list, but only 9.5% identify themselves as Christians. The reason for that is because the various ways that they describe their theological perspective or their worldview. Listen to this breakdown. 46% say that they are humanists. And we're going to get to that in just a little bit. What is a humanist? 19% declare themselves to be earth-centered or what is referred to as and neo-pagan. 13% identify themselves as being theists. 6% mysticism. 4% Buddhism. 1% Judaism. And 13% that just say we're pretty much out of scope of anything traditional. <laughs> so really when you come and you start looking at the dynamic here, this is really kind of an everything goes type Church. I'm going to use that word church very, very loosely. The total membership of this church has grown 25% since 1982. Right now, there are currently about 250,000 members within that church. Which, when you compare that to Southern Baptist Convention, you know, Southern Baptist Denomination, Church of God, Church of you know, those kinds of uh, denominations, you start looking at it and go, well, that's not very much. Well, that is quite, that is a chunk of people. But what we're seeing is that it is an increasing chunk of people. And where we're seeing churches and uh, denominations declining in growth, there are some of these that are actually increasing in growth. Why do you think that is? It's what the Apostle Paul told Timothy. He said, in the latter times, there will be men who will have itching ears. And they will heap around themselves teachers that basically teach what they want to hear. As a matter of fact, 
whenever I, I think of this religion, I titled it. You remember the song, Give Me That Old Time Religion? Well, I think this is a religion for our time. Because we live in an age where kind of everything goes. It is crazy. Susan and I, the other night, were talking about this. We said, you know, what is Rebecca's world going to look like? And I think as we have younger children and grandchildren, we have to ask the question, what is their world going to look like when we see how the pendulum has swung in such drastic ways in, in literally, guys, the last 10 years? More probably has happened in cultural slide in the last 10 years than we have ever seen. Even as we talked about this morning with articles like Time Life or Time Magazine. Time Magazine celebrates babies on one hand, yet celebrates abortion on the other. You can't have, you know, they don't say you can't have your cake and eat it too. Do you know that is actually a misnomer? You can't have your cake and eat it too? It's you can't have your cake and eat it too. Did y'all know that? That's how they call the Unabomber. That's a whole other message for you. <laughs> Words truly matter. They really do. Words truly matter. And when we look at religions like this, and what they believe really matters because it feeds and it is really indicative of the current situation of our culture. And, you know, we said this before. We, we're not living in Mayberry anymore, are we? And the reality is, Mayberry, even when we were living in Mayberry, really wasn't Mayberry. Uh, because we have been on a cultural slide for about, oh, 200 years. We think it's been in the last 50 or 60, but no. What really brought it to light, and what you see with, with churches like this, is the, uh, the sexual revolution of the 60s. That really kind of brought it all to light. And that really is where, from a perspective of a worldview, which is how you view the lens with which you view your world. That's what a worldview means. If you are a born-again Christian, then you come to the world with a Christian worldview. The lens that you are using are the teachings of Scripture, and the teachings of Jesus. That is the, the lens. That's what's giving you the focus in your worldview. But what we saw is a, an extreme shift in worldview during the 60s and when we see the uh, rampant drug abuse, we see the abortions that's taking place, all those things, uh, as a matter of fact, we have prayer taken out of school, all those things can be traced back to the kind of the last gasp, if you will, of the sexual revolution of the 60s, which we are still seeing today. Because the interesting thing about that Time Magazine article that I didn't go into because it wasn't necessary for this morning's message, but it actually goes beyond just talking about fertility. And it actually goes into talking about transgenderism and how children should identify their sexuality. Because the reality, and you know, we are talking about things and we are having to address things in our next generation ministry and even here to us big kids that we never thought we'd have to address in church. But is what we do with a male child who is being told it's okay to identify with a female, as a female? Or what do we do with a male, female child where the culture is saying it's okay to identify themselves as a male? And you think that that is not a big issue, but culturally it is a huge issue. Matter of fact, if you click on the TV, it, is, it astounds me how this last fall Hollywood, which is where so much of this stuff, this propaganda comes out of. It is, it's just propaganda. Because what they will do is they will take something that represents less than 0.3% of the population and apply it to say this is how everybody feels. And because they have the propaganda machine in order to make it seem that way. So this last fall, whenever you started seeing some of these new shows, a lot started popping up and all of a sudden you have these kids. And particularly what we're seeing are boys. Particularly what we're seeing out of Hollywood are boys who are dressing like girls or boys who are dressing by identifying themselves as being gender neutral or not assigned gender. That's where the LGBTQ question mark comes in. There's lesbians, bisexual. There's transsexual, right? There's questionable. And then there are those who just haven't decided yet. 
what sex they're going to identify with. Never in a million years. And you realize we've only had that conversation really at, at that level, at, the, at this level, for the last three years. And the reason for that is because we're, we continuously live in a culture and uh, baby boomers, as baby boomers have come came into the culture, they're looking for moral education for their children, but they were looking for a moral education outside a particular theological context. And that's why we saw such this surge. Many of you probably grew up in church. You, you, you just went to church. If you were a Christian growing up, you went to church. But what happened with a lot of the baby boomers we began to see is they didn't want mom and daddy's church anymore. They wanted their children to have a moral education, but they didn't want it within the constraints of a religious dogma. And so what we have seen now is another generation come on board, baby boomers, then the baby busters. And you have the busters, which is our, my generation. And you have they, those have come through, and you see this idea that none, that they no, a lot of people in my generation came into their 20s not wanting to believe in anything in particular, but what we're seeing now that they're going into, like I said, into their 50, some of them into their 50s and even late 50s, is they're starting to identify more with a, a denominational standard or maybe a, a church standard, if you will. But what we have seen then as we get into the millennials, as we find now another generation who is now the millennials, we, we think about, you look at the kids in high school, we say, oh, there's millennials. No, those aren't millennials, by the way. Millennials are already graduate, pretty much have graduated from college, and they're the ones that are in Washington right now. Um, a lot of what you see, a lot of the young people that you see that were elected into the House of Representatives this past time, uh, into the Senate, those are millennials. That's the millennial generation. And look how skewed a lot of their views are. Uh, and the reason for that is because they have grown up with this idea that everything goes, that there is no particular theological uh, context, and we can trace that all the way back to the baby boomers. Because the baby boomers did not want their children, statistically, growing up in a particular theological context. So we see that back, so we go back at the end of World War II, and I know it's kind of a lot, but it kind of all ties together. We get to the end of World War II, and we see a serious shift uh, in, in worldview, particularly in Christian worldview. So religions of our time, religions like this, of, of uni, uh, Unitarian and Universalist, look very appealing because gays and lesbians, bisexuals and transgenders, they're attracted to it because it's inclusive on issues of sexual orientation. So, and what, but unfortunately what has happened in what we'll call mainstream Christianity is instead of uh, reaching out to those folks and witnessing to them, sharing them the love of Jesus, we have really sent a lot of hate messages to them. That is a reality. I do not agree with the lifestyle at all. Never get me wrong on that. But I do think that we have dropped the ball as Christians over about 35 to 40 years, um, where we shun that lifestyle instead of saying, look, look, you need Jesus. Your sin is no different than mine. I needed Jesus. You need Jesus. Okay. Uh, so what began to happen is there was this continued polarization there. But the Unitarian Universalist name comes from their denial of the doctrine of the Trinity and their belief that all human beings gain salvation. That's what the term universalist means. It means that everybody who, if, if God created man, then man saved. Okay? Everybody's going to heaven. We do realize that not all dogs go to heaven, right? We do not all go to heaven. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, you are not going to go to heaven when you die. And that is, and you know, I, and people say, well, you believe that because you're a Baptist, right? No, I believe that because I'm a Christian. I believe that because that's what the Word of God says. And there is enough proof that this is an infallible Word. I don't need anything else to tell me anything otherwise. This Bible does not need to prove itself, but it does every single day in medicine, in science. In history, in archaeology, every single day, this book proves itself. Yet re realize this, it is not mandated to do so. This word does not have to prove itself. But God says that we will know him simply by looking around. He is every he is in very creation. We know there's existence of God. And you know, now it's cold and it's kind of oh, but the, the spring's coming, and that's when we celebrate that resurrection power. Amen? Amen. When everything starts breaking through the ground. But according to Universalists, the mere idea of someone might go to hell is not compatible with the character of a loving God. Well, does that sound familiar? 
Bertrand Russell and many uh, anti-theists and theists alike over the years have said, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? And we have to remind people that God does not send us to hell. We send ourselves to hell. The Bible is very clear that the hell was never built for, for his human creation. Those made his image and likeness. It was for Satan and his demons. That's who it was built for. But when we rebel against God in the manner of which Satan rebelled against God, then we get the same real estate. And that's how this comes to pass. And so when we're telling people that, you know, God doesn't send people to hell, we send ourselves to hell. We do that with, with love and compassion and say, but the greater, and take them to the cross, run to that cross every single time and say, but God gave us a way out. But the roots of the Universalist movement actually go all the way back to the 16th century. So, see, we think that everything was kind of Mayberry, but in reality, Mayberry wasn't always Mayberry. It goes back to the 16th century when the Unitarian beliefs became popular during the Reformation. And the Unitarian thought and Universal thought were merged together in late 18th century America. Okay? So this stuff's been around for a while. During the age of reason. Of course, the age of reason says that it is not reasonable to believe that there is a God. There's, some fan, there's a fantastic book out there called The Age of Reason. You read it, and it's going to make it, and, you're, and it's going to like, wow. And what it was, it was written by Robert Zacharias as a counterattack, if you will, against Sam Harris's book entitled A Letter to a Christian Nation. And Sam Harris is a devout anti-theist, and he wrote a, a tremendous charge, uh, charging God and charging Christians about how unloving that we all are. And then, but the age of reason, we see uh, a great rebuttal to that by Ravi Zacharias. Just a fantastic read. But the intellectual elite of the time refused to believe in biblical teachings as total depravity and eternal damnation, but rather embrace the idea of a loving God who would never call someone to suffer. And we see that today. We see that today, unfortunately, in mainstream church. Because there seems to be this sentiment, and oh, y'all, I struggle with this every day because I see it posted on Facebook every day. Every day. You see people saying, well, if God's so good, why am I going through this? Or you will then see somebody say, well, you know, if, if God, why am I suffering? And we have to understand that we live in a fallen world. That question I am asked more than any question is why do Christians suffer? Why, if, you, if we are saved, why do we suffer? Because we live in a fallen world. <laughs> suffering is a part of it. And that's not... But guess what? I've got good news. And it's the good news. That heaven's sweet hell's hot, but Jesus said. And that yes, suffering does come along. But what God does in the midst of our suffering, he draws us unto himself ever closer. We experience God no fuller or better than when we're suffering. God will take that suffering and change us and shape us. To become better. But unfortunately if we're not careful. We just become bitter. Adherence to the Unitarian Universalism. Base their beliefs upon. Their own existence. Their experiences. And are not committed to any one religious system. They believe that individuals have. And I'm reading from their site here. They believe that individuals have the right. To decide for themselves. What to believe in. And that others should not infringe. Upon that right. Does that sound familiar? That kind of sounds like, oh, don't infringe upon our right. But when we talk about Jesus, they're ready to string you up, right? That's okay. That's okay. Jesus never said that we were supposed to be popular. Jesus never said that he was one more way in, the, in this menu of ways. He said he was the way. And when you draw a line in the sand like that, you're going to get backlash. Because that is the absolute of absolutes right there. There is only one way to heaven. Oh, and Oprah says, no, that cannot be. And I oftentimes wonder why Oprah allowed herself to fall away from her Baptist beliefs. I really do. 
I think it was probably Hollywood, to be honest with you. I think she got called in stardom, and I'll tell you what, that is a multi-billion dollar propaganda machine that brainwashes unlike any other. I'll be honest with you, sometimes you really have to watch some of it and say, am I seeing what's actually going on, or am I actually watching what they want me to see? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There was a movie a number of years ago, Quinn and I were talking about this called, called uh, Wagging the Dog. How do we as Christians keep our worldview in a culture like that? By staying true to the Word of God. I'm telling you right now, stay true to the Word of God. You will drift off course if you take your eyes off the compass. Every single time. And you know what is amazing about that? If you've ever been on the water in a boat, it doesn't have to be big waves to knock you off course. Matter of fact, it's usually just the opposite. It's those little waves that don't seem to really matter. That all of a sudden you find yourself, Miss Carol, if we've done far off the place where you originally started. Sister Carol sings a song. She's got to sing it for me next week. When anchor holds. Well, follow me. Whenever you're here, whenever you're not working, and I'm here. So we'll go for three weeks. The anchor holds. But what a message in that song. Though the, though the ship is battered. And sometimes that our ship gets battered in, in, ma in major ways. And sometimes it's just a... But if we don't stay focused on what the Word of God said, we will drift off course. As a result, one such believer might lean toward liberal Christianity, while another might lean toward New Age spirituality. There's no real dogma beyond tolerance for everything except biblical Christianity. They don't want that. Nope. We'll take all the tricks you have to offer. But not biblical Christianity. Why? Because it's truth. It's truth. When people are running from the Bible, you have to stop and ask yourself why. Because it is truth, and it is hard truth, guys. Don't read the Bible thinking that God's going to be stroking your fur every morning. If you've got one of those devotions, burn it. You need a, de a devotion that says you ain't no good, no way, no how. And start your morning off that way. That's a real positive uplifter. You just ain't no good. You're rotten to the core. But Jesus loves you, died for you. That's the kind of devotion that you need. The world is rotten and going to hell in a handbasket, but the gospel is saves everybody who will trust in Jesus. I'm telling you, we need one of those kind of devotions. Get into the book of James for a while and see how wonderful you feel about yourself. <laughs> Unitary universes view the Bible as a book of poetry, myth, and moral teaching. A completely human book and not truly the word of God. Isn't it interesting that the people who declare themselves to be humanists don't recognize the Bible because it's too human? Come on! They don't even realize they're about, that's the beauty of this. When you're looking at it, you're going to you not hear yourselves. You have to scratch your head because, and you know, but let me tell you, if you don't stay focused on what the Word of God is saying, and if you'll pour yourself into it and see what's going on, it's so easy to just say, well, you know, the Bible was penned by people. Yes, it was penned by people. It says it was penned by people as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God. They did not have a bad taco. They were not suffering from a, a, a night of, of missleep. Their pen was being moved. It is God breathed. I think about that as a baby when it's first born. When a baby is first born, they've got to do something. Y'all know what it is? When that baby comes out, that baby's got a plug right in their throat. They get that little sucker. 
and they get that plug out, and then that baby starts screaming. Oh my goodness, and they don't stop for the next, what, 27 years? I don't know. <laughs> and that's when that first breath, that's kind of like that God breathed. That's when, that, that's when just, just the, the, the newness of life, so to speak. Air has filled their lungs. Now they're ready to trod on this planet of sod, right? Now they're ready to walk earth. Now they're ready to, to be a part of everything that is going on. They reject the Bible's portrayal of a triune God, leaving the concept of God up to each individual's imagination. And there we go. There we go. I've said this many times. I'll say it again tonight just because I have to because he opened it up for me. If we're not careful, we worship the God of our imagination rather than the God of what? Scripture. Sometimes we worship the God of our imagination rather than the God of Scripture. Because we make up pictures of who God is in our mind. Apart from the Bible, we can be good old Southern Baptists and have a very distorted view of God. We have to get into the Bible. And see why God does and did the things he did. You know, we're going through the Old Testament, y'all. We're getting ready to hit Joshua here in just a little while. There's going to be a whole lot of killing going on. You get Joshua, you get into Kings and Chronicles. You better know why God's doing what God's doing. Or you can get a really strange image of God. So people begin to think that, well... If I just think about God in this way, this is what how God, what he means to me. This is what he looks to me. That is a very dangerous place to be. To the Unitarian Universalist, Jesus was a good moral teacher. Yes, he was. However, they believed he was nothing more than that. So they're right up in line with Islam and some of his others. He is not considered to be divine. And every miracle associated with him is rejected as being outside of human reason again as it spawned from human reason. Most sayings of Jesus recorded in the Bible are regarded as embellishments on the part of the authors. Really. Again, that's people who have never read the Bible. Because there's one thing about a book, particularly a book of history, particularly a book of history from the periods of time that this book came, pieces of it came from. You never wrote bad news about yourself. Oh, you did not. Let, let me put it you that way. You would never have, it, 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 it has to be of God because the Jewish people would never have wanted to say how rebellious they were the thousands of times that the Bible says that they were rebellious. You didn't speak of negative things like that. You didn't speak of losses. You only spoke of victory and seizing and accomplishment. But the fact that the Bible speaks of the depravity of man and our weaknesses and our failures at the hand of the author themselves. Paul could have said, man, I was the greatest dude that ever rode a donkey. Couldn't he? I was smarter than anybody in my school, which he was. I had insight and eyesight unlike others. And I was cleaning house because there was this element in our country that needed to go. But did he say that? He said, no, I'm the chief of the chiefest of sinners. And how interesting that one who has such great eyesight and insight is the very eyesight God took for him in order for him to have insight about Christ. Most of the saints of Jesus, their embellishments, they say, well, you know, when you're dealing with the supernatural, some things, you know what, we just don't, we can't wrap our head around. I cannot wrap my head around the Mount of Transfiguration. If I could just get past that, that's a huge deal. To me, that is huge. That the glory of the all-powerful God, God, <laughs> comes out of Jesus. And he grabs, basically it's like he took a, took a, the ends of it and pulled it back into himself. How do you do that? It's God, but it's, it's, yes, it's God, but what? Their 
is an element of faith that has to be present in the life of a believer. Not everything is black and white. I don't know how he did it, but I have faith he did it. Pastor, he said, our, my ways are not your ways. No They're not. Far beyond your ways. That's far beyond my ways. But we walk, oftentimes, we want to put, we want to put markers and, and statements of, that's what it is, when we really don't know. I don't know how the blood of Jesus went from his body on this cross into the third heaven, put on the mercy seat. He comes back, walks in a garden, Mary sees him. I don't know how all that happened. Do any of us? But I have faith it did. Because the Bible said it did. I don't know how it happened. I don't know how it is within reason to think that even though my body is dust in the earth, hundreds and thousands of years old, one day, just a statement, just a word from Jesus will raise it all incorruptible in Christ. I don't know. I, you know how I, it's faith. I don't know how in the world just by saying God say let there be that everything came. It took but four months to build this wall pit. I go in any project and start working on it. It takes time. Oh, years. God just said, let it be. We have to understand that faith is imperative. And that we're not talking about reason always. I never will forget when our former president of the International Mission Board, he says, I cannot understand how a bloody man hanging on a stick saved me from my sin. seems completely unreasonable. But he did it. Among universalist beliefs, Jesus did not die to save mankind from sin. They believe as man is not a fallen sinner. Of course not. Emphasis is placed on humankind's capacity for goodness. Sin is completely relative. And the term itself is rarely used because man saves himself through personal improvement. There you go. I'm just getting better. <laughs> I can look in the mirror every morning and know that I'm not getting any better. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> if you've ever cleaned out the bottom of your shower after washing your hair, you know that you're not getting any better. Salvation being a purely worldly experience. They believe it is a waking up to the world around oneself. They believe also that death is final. They deny the existence of an afterlife. So all we have on earth is all we'll ever get. Wow. That's demoralizing. I feel like poor Beck. I was so funny. Beck is so cute. I'll tell her what she said today. So if she's not in here, I tell her. She doesn't like me to tell stories on her now that she's getting older. She's not mine. Now she says, Dad, why'd you tell that? Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to be more careful. But she did something so cute today. We were going home and she, she was telling me about she and, she and Kevin and their challenge. And I said, now let me tell you something about Pastor Kevin. If he puts his mind to something, he's going to see it through. So he will give you a run for your money. <laughs> And she says, yeah, but I've got, I said, I know, but I just want you to understand. Don't underestimate Pastor Kevin. He's going to keep you a run for his money. She goes, well, Daddy, though, that just makes me feel real good. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> I felt terrible. <laughs> Shame, Dad. 
But that's kind of how I feel right here. When they, you wrap up with this, that, all, this on earth is all we'll ever get. It just won't draw up. Well, that just doesn't make me feel very good, now, does it? That, it, just, it just doesn't. But you know what the reality is? There are millions of people. We just see a few hundred thousand that hold to this belief system. But this really is quite the identifier of our culture today. This is really where we're living. And what we have to do is take them to Jesus every single time. We take them to the cross. Whether they're neo-pagan and they're worshiping the earth and they're doing uh, worshiping the great mother goddess, maiden or mother or crone or woman, whatever they identify her to be, Jesus died for them too. Whether they focus more on ecological issues, natural foods, remedies, and animal protection than anything else, Jesus died for them too. That's right. So you take them to the cross with this understanding. Five things we'll leave you with. What do we do in light of these of this belief system? One, we teach and preach that God alone is worthy of worship, not man. Secondly, the Bible condemns witchcraft. So those that are involved in witchcraft, which a lot of them are, you've got to deal with that. You've got to tell them that that is wrong. You've got to be able to call it what it is. It is witchcraft. Uh, we see a lot of witchcraft uh, in our stores. You see a lot of symbolism and stuff like that. Be very careful with it. Don't put it in your house. The third thing is, is the Bible has a lot to say about the worship of other gods or goddesses. <laughs> God says he's very jealous. And there's no value to be worshiping him. And the Bible also says we're not to worship nature. We're to take care of nature. We're to take care of the, I believe... That is scriptural mandate. That is part of, what, about, of man being given dominion of the earth and, to, and subduing it. I believe that's part of taking care. I believe that is being ecologically minded. But we do not worship the earth. But too many in this movement have no problems with aborting babies. But please make sure you don't damage the spotted owl. That, that's, that's literally true. Don't realize that, right? They're proponent, these groups are proponents of abortion, but they will throw themselves in front of a bus over the spotted owl because they worship nature. Many of them. And also remind them that the Bible affirms the reality of Satan and his influence, that it's evil. That he has three motives, to steal, to kill, and destroy. So one of the things you have to be with these folks is very direct. But at the end of all that, what do you do? Take them to the cross. Get them to the cross as fast as you can. And tell them it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who you've worshipped. There is salvation in one name. His name is Jesus Christ. I want to share with you what they said on their web page. They, at the, on their web page, they said, Welcome to Unitarian Universalism. They said Unitarian Universalism is a caring, open-minded religion that encourages seekers to find their own spiritual path. Our faith draws on many religious sources, welcoming people with different beliefs. We are united by shared values, not by creed or dogma. Our congregations are places where we gather to nurture our spirits and put our faith into action by helping to make communities and the world a better place. When I read that, and I'm going to, there will be people that would disagree with the statement I'm going to make. That sounds like the tagline of most seeker friendly churches in the country today. We're more about drawing a crowd rather than seeing the movement of God. Was it Charles Spurgeon that said, a monkey can draw, can build a congregation, or can draw a crowd? only the Spirit of God can build a congregation. So we have to be very careful that even our church doesn't become one where we just want to make our community and the world a better place. That's great. But it can never replace what our purpose is, and that is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And that's, I believe, why God has really challenged us with the reach this year is to reach this community unlike we have ever before. And um, I believe God is already setting things in place for us to do just that. 
so that we can take the, the absolutes of Scripture into the world. Because, guys, I'll tell you right now, the world needs absolutes. Because right now, it's like a big old ship floating, floating without a compass in many, many ways. Pray for our president, our cabinet, his cabinet, and our, and our national state leaders. That, that, that the Christians in these places, because we've got, there are a lot of Christians. But they will apply their worldview and not try to go for political success. For political expediency. Because I truly believe this, if they will stay on the side of God, politics will take care of themselves. <coughs> I believe we have history to show us that. So please pray. A lot of things happen. Turn on the news today. Within 20 minutes, I'll turn it off so that I can't take any more right now. It is like the Democrats and the Republicans are absolutely at a stalemate. Please be in prayer for our country. And please be in prayer for our president. Uh, may not agree with everything he does, but we need to pray for him always. Um, we got to pray for him. We also need to pray for his health. You know, for safety, because he's rocking a lot of boats. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that are going on right now that um, we just need to be very, very much prayerful. Very much prayerful. But I do believe this is going to be a tremendous year for our country. I really do. I believe this is going to be a tremendous year in the life of our church. I believe this is going to be a tremendous year in the life of our community and the nation as a whole. Um, what God is doing. Just things that I've seen um, that he's just putting into place. Um, the things that other people have seen that God's just doing some amazing work. So let's keep on winning people for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's get the baptism more stirring. Amen? Amen? Amen. Everyone would stand. Father God, we thank you tonight for your many blessings. Lord, we thank you for the truth of Scripture tonight. Lord, we thank you once again of allowing us moments to learn how to reach men and women and children that are in our very community and, and within the context of our work and, and where we serve and where we minister that we can effectively share the gospel with them. Father God, thank you for allowing us this time together today. Lord, as we come into a brand new week, we ask God that you just Give us your power. Give us your strength. Be with those who are sick. Father God, may your strength be upon those that are even right now, Miss Norma and uh, Brother Dwight and others that are just battling uh, colds and allergies and things. Father God, just bless them with your healing. Lord God, be with those that are traveling. We pray for travel mercies upon the families that are on the road and on the seas this weekend. And God, we just give you all the praise and the honor and glory. Lord, we ask God that you spend us as you send us among the people as we live our life on mission for you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.